Hello everyone. This video is a conversation between myself and my friend Jeremy Siskind, who is a Los Angeles-based jazz pianist. Jeremy and I have been friends for a number of years and we like hanging out and talking about stuff. And so in this video, we're having a conversation about improvisation, how uh, the way that it works for classical players is alike and not alike the way that it works for jazz players. So we cover teaching and practicing and performing and rules and all kinds of stuff. So it's a long conversation. I hope you enjoy it, uh, this discussion between two uh, professional improvisers. Be sure to check out Jeremy's website and his publications. He's got a lot to offer and he's truly a leader in the field of jazz piano and jazz education. Enjoy the conversation. Hey everybody, this is Jeremy Siskin. I am the author of this beautiful book, Playing Solo Jazz Piano. Um, and I'm here with a dear friend, uh, John Mortensen. And John is one of, let's say, the world's leading experts in classical or sometimes called historical improvisation. Um, and so we're going to do a little bit of an interchange, interview one another um, to talk about the differences between what he does and what I do as a jazz imp improviser. So uh, welcome, John. Thank you so much, Jeremy. I'm really looking forward to talking about this and um, not just for our viewers, but just for myself to learn about how you think in terms of improv and, and to talk about some of the things that are similar and some of the things that are different between our two worlds. And um, let me just review for people who don't know you. I believe like you're You've got a lot of qualifications, of course. You're a long-time professor at Cedarville University in Ohio, but you're also now the author of a textbook on historical improvisation. Is that right? Right. And you held a book up, so I think I can also Let's hold see, a book up. See your book. I don't know if I can keep up with you with all this flashing of books, but here, here it is. It's called the, yes. the Pianist's Guide to Historic Improvisation. Um, and I did just finish another one. It's in the review process with the publisher. Um, I printed off my own and it doesn't look like anything. It's just a big stack of papers. It's called Improvising Fugue. Wow. And uh, and it's it kind of, well, I don't want to talk about it too much, but it combines the insights of what's called the partimento tradition with what you have to know when you improvise fugue. So that should be out uh, within probably a few months. So Amazing. I can't wait. Um, I guess... You know what I want to start with um, is your why and why classical improvisation or historical improvisation. And let, let me tell you the context for my question, which is that for me, improvisation is so deeply about self-expression and about being able to express yourself in the moment. Um, yeah. And there's something and I, I prepare to be corrected. <laughs> um, you know, there's something about, you know, this idea of historical improvisation, which feels not so much about self-expression as about kind of maintaining a tradition um, and doing things within a certain set of rules. So I guess my question is, one, am I wrong in that perception? I'm so ready to hear a yes that I am wrong. <laughs> um, and second, so what, then what is your why? Is it about self-expression or is it about something else? Well, you, you're not wrong, um, which uh, I'm happy to say, because as you know, you're so rarely wrong, Jeremy. Um, <laughs> You're not wrong about the rules. Uh, all harmonic languages have rules. Um, this set of sounds is part of the language. That set of sounds is not part of the language. When you have this sound, you can go to here, 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 uh, but you can't go there from this sound. And the historic thing has the same kind of stuff as jazz, but just more strict because a lot of the development of music history is, is the acceptance of more types of dissonance, actually. So one of the big things that they would argue about is, um, can a fifth have a third and make a triad? And is that really consonant? Can, can we do that? Uh, okay, we can do it in the middle of a piece, but can we do it at the end of a piece? Well, we can do major, but we can we do minor? We're not sure. Um, then comes the seventh, when you have a cadence and a dominant chord. Do you have to prepare the seventh by common tone or can you just jump to it because uh, and then on and on and on. And then suddenly Debussy is playing half diminished chords with no preparation of anything. Uh, a great example of this, by the way, is the blues, where all dominant sevenths are now consonant. 
Um, so, you know, I did, there's, it's a wonderful kind of thing to, to study and explore um, when you play music of various uh, styles. And so when you go back to the 18th century, yeah, a lot more things are rule bound and, and you can't just do them willy nilly. Um, the biggest one is the preparation and resolution of dissonance. Uh, it's it's a it's a big job to handle it for sure. And what you get in return if you do it is you get the language, that beautiful language. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot of rules, and you spend a lot of time working on rules. As far as self expression, yeah, I, I would say a hundred percent. It's self expression, a hundred percent. All art works within rules and. And anyone in that art form is going to get used to those rules and doesn't think of them really as restrictions, um, just as the frame of the picture. You know, I'm going to paint within that. And in some ways it's limiting, but in some ways it's freeing. But so that part of it, I would say, yeah, there's there's a strong element of self-expression in it. Um, so now I got to ask you something. Uh, you have somewhat positioned yourself in kind of what I would call the, you know, the golden age of jazz, somewhere between um, swing and bebop inclusive. And really you go back and I, I hear you do a lot of um, stride piano, which is, you know, a very early style. Uh, when you want to move outside those languages what do you use as rules? Because I know you don't just go the heck with everything, nothing matters. But when, and I've heard you do this kind of thing, improvising on Paul Simon, or um, I heard you once do a really long 30 minute nonstop epic display of genius thing. Um, what is it that you go after for rules when you're going beyond swing and even bebop? Yeah, so no, it's interesting to hear you talk about rules um, because I think you are right that any style, whether it's Baroque music of whatever century Baroque happened in or, you know, bebop of the 1940s, there are certain kind of rules of the road. Um, that said, as jazz musicians, I think we like to think about the rules less and internalize them orally rather than internalize them from a theoretical perspective. Mm -hmm. I think now that jazz education is, you know, kind of advancing and becoming more formal in the institution, of course, yes, we have classes about jazz theory where we do formalize um, things and help to kind of give somebody a little bit of a push in the direction, maybe of a certain scale or a certain, you know, chord type. Um, but I think, and, you know, uh, I might throw this question back to you at some point, but for me, when I'm playing, I don't want to be thinking about those rules at all. And in fact, the best moments are when I completely forget what the style is supposed to be, um, or, you know, I guess even though those words supposed to be would completely vanish and I'm completely following my ear um, and whatever, emo whatever the emotional content is. So the answer to your question is that, you know, I think I've internally processed or an orally process, a lot of information that might come across as rules. But if I'm doing something that, you know, is not historical in the sense that I'm trying to really match Oscar Peterson's style or really match Thelonious Monk's style or really match Teddy Wilson's style, um, I'm not thinking about those kinds of things. Um, I'm not thinking in a theoretical way. Hopefully what I'm doing is I'm A, trusting my ear, B, thinking about emotional prompts, you know, maybe the lyric of a song or if I'm doing a completely free improvisation, I'm thinking about a poem or a painting or an experience I had in my life. Um, and then three, maybe thinking about a handful of small musical goals um, so that there's some kind of content that I'm aiming for. And the musical goal might be going from softer to louder, right? Or it might be making each section different, you know, giving some kind of a different presentation of each section. Or it might be, um, I'm going to limit myself to two voices for the first chorus of the piece. Um, or it might be, I'm going to, uh, you know, start out of time and get into time, right? You know, these kind of small, really basic things that just help to give, for me, some kind of a frame to the picture, like you're saying. Um, but yeah, for me, um, the goal would be that it's not like 
at all an intellectual exercise that if there's rules, I don't want to know them. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. Actually, this is a great quote by Kenny Wheeler, the great trumpet player, flugelhorn player, and, you know, one of the, our most beloved jazz composers who said, you know, if I have a process for writing a tune. I don't want to know it. <laughs> I want to be able to, uh, to, uh, you know, approach each compositional experience, each creative experience from a completely fresh place, because otherwise maybe I get into these same patterns. So throwing it back to you, um, and I think this might be a short answer, but it seems like that's a big difference between what the two of us do. That, that's almost antithetical. You want to know that process. You need to follow the rules. Because yeah. that, that's what gives you a sense of that you're doing the style correctly uh, or that you're doing the style in a legitimate way. 